Welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Olaf Furness, a journalist, but also founder of the Born to be Wide organisation, which is putting on the latest Wide Days convention between the 13th and 15th of April in Edinburgh. So first of all, hello, Olaf. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. So before you talk about this year's Wide Days, can you give us a bit of background and history to Born to be Wide and Wide Days? Yes, so in 2002, I moved back to Scotland, it's a long, long time ago now, around the same time as a friend of mine, we'd both been working in London um, as journalists. And I'd been a music industry journalist, so I had a lot of contacts in the music industry. And when I moved back to Scotland, I was still freelancing for Billboard and Music Week and maintaining those those contacts really. So what happened was that uh, we, my friend and Brody and I got a bit fed up that every time there was a launch, we'd have to go through to, to Glasgow because we both lived in Edinburgh. And it was nothing against Glasgow. We really liked Glasgow, but it was there's nothing worse than that night bus um, <laughs> from Buchanan Street back to Edinburgh when you've had a few pints. So we, we thought, well, let's try and bring the the music scene together in Edinburgh. And the idea was really just to um, have a night where it served as a kind of leveler. So if you are a musician or you just started a label, you could connect with journalists, um, with you know, music lawyers, anything really, um, other label owners, other artists. And the night was called Born to be Wide, and we launched it in the venue um, in Edinburgh, which um, is sadly no more, um, in 2004. And the idea was we'd just invite people to come and play their favourite records. And we also had a rule for the first year that you were only allowed to come and DJ if you'd never DJed before because we want people to be utterly self-indulgent so it's really just to get a, a snapshot like an extended desert island discs from our guests and we pretty quickly started getting people with you know they're quite prominent in the music scene from you know big promoters right through to you know big journalists and you know, even managers and um, and one lawyer. So it it really um, it really started to develop, and then we we moved we moved to the street, which was a a new bar that our DJ friend of ours, Trendy Wendy, um, called, and it continued in that vein for about four years. So we we started then getting people from other parts of Scotland, people that were visiting and um, so if there was an artist on tour you'd you'd invite them we'd invite we'd invite different personalities that we knew had a penchant for good music so the footballer pat nevin now a uh, very illustrious um radio personality um he came and we had him on the same night as grant from the go-betweens and it turned out they they were really big sort of fans of each other so it was it's really nice to do that. We did we do ones in the fringe, so you know the kind of s s a mixture of things happening in the fringe and the book festivals. So we had Kristen Hirsch, um, the drummers from Dodgy and the Love Affair, and Irvin Welsh on the same night um, in the Voodoo Rooms, and then in 2010 I hosted a night in partnership with the German consulate. So we had the Consul General DJing with the vinyl that had travelled with him from every single diplomatic posting to the next oh. one. And um, a German act called uh, Jeans Team, and we did a panel there. And the, those panels start to take off in 2008. We realised that people really enjoyed listening to things that dis demystified the music industry. And in... Um, about what's two months after doing the Born to Be Wide night, um, we hosted Wide Days, and that was that was the very first one. It was conceived as a conference actually, rather than a showcase event. So right. I got a bit fed up about hearing all the same panel discussions, and you know, having seen all the same people at music industry conventions that 
you know, I worked for quite a few of them and it, I thought I'm just going to do something different here. And I also wanted to be a leveler because I felt that, you know, at that point, the older generation that could learn something from the younger generation, we we're actually, I think, the first event that I know of um, that made all our ticketing digital. And it was a student at Napier University that devised this system to do it. It also meant when we're double booked by the original venue, we could move venue with a week to go and which we had to do um and really then um we we did it on a total shoestring sold out i think all 110 places and we thought well while we've got all these music industry people in edinburgh let's uh let's make them watch some emerging scottish acts so we had seven acts on and you know the following it was just a one-day conference and the following year we did it for two days and um we very much kept that focus on the on the artists um you know but very very tight focus on the artists so i didn't feel that people needed to be overwhelmed with loads of facts they'd never heard of mm -hmm. my idea was like let's have them all play 20 minutes work really closely with the musicians to make sure that they bring their crowd and that it looks good they're not playing to an empty room and we'll bring the industry crowd so there's a there's a nice symbiosis there. And that's pretty much the ethos that's that's continued. We we changed the name to Wide Events about four years ago. Um, so under Wide Events, now we have Born to be Wide, Wide Days, and a youth event called Off the Record, which is really geared towards um, demystifying the music industry and really just teaching the young team all the classic mistakes and how to avoid them and we worked out we can do that in less than a day so there'll be this is the 10th year of off the record and there'll be something happening later this year i mean that's what strikes me uh looking at the program you've put on is that you've got this um great situation where industry people can discover new bands and new bands can learn from those industry people at the beginning of their careers which often is where the mistakes are made yeah, and you know, it's interesting because we feel we learned through off the record that you can, if you can start speaking to uh, young musicians and young people looking to work in the industry, be it as managers or promoters or, you know, anything else really, because there's a lot of careers in the music industry that aren't necessarily create. I was going to say accounting, but maybe that can be creative, but, um, you know, <laughs> where, where creativity isn't necessarily a, a core of that sector of the music industry. Maybe insurance is, is a better example than accounting, but it is that thing where you, if you start to explain at an early stage, you find that often um younger artists or younger um music professionals take that advice on board in a way that you know older ones don't so they just keep making the same mistakes and then getting angry with the world that you know they're uh, <laughs> no one's paying attention to them and it's like well it's really easy you just put someone's name in the email you know and then they'll pay more attention but I think that this is where um, we've really found that having a having that mixture and having that leveler, because you know there used to be an event called in the city, which I'm sure um, you're of the same vintage as me. You'll you'll remember, and it was founded by Tony Wilson from Factory Records, and it it did once take place in Glasgow. It usually took place in Manchester, and artists were kept out of the main conference area. So the only way that artists could connect with the industry people was if they found them in the hotel lobby. And I thought that was, I didn't like that us and them thing. I kind of figured that, you know, having everyone together is is the best approach. And it always has been that that leveler in, you know, it's been part of what we do, that ability for you know, a man, a veteran manager like Stevie Wonder's manager, Keith Harris, hanging out with, you know, a manager in their early 20s or with artists and, you know, really creating a community around it. So, you know, we've, we, we've always invited people we like to speak. And, you know, on the very odd occasion that 
someone's been a bit of a dick we've just not really invited them back you know but most people are really nice and they they know that they're they're also there to impart the knowledge they they're there to really help people so we were also the first event that just introduced uh, a meeting strand where we said to we said to all the speakers would you be able and willing to do 15 minute meetings and mm -hmm. 99% of them say yes. The odd one that says no is because they've had a bad experience, but overall people are really willing to do that. And that's really part of what we do as well. It's it's about making it a, you know, a, a leveler, but also making it a, a fun and enjoyable event. And with that in mind, what could people expect from this year's convention? Well, Every year we try and uh, for the past few years, we try to have a, a certain type of focus and um, we are we're in the process of founding a, a music export office with uh, Lisa, Lisa Whitter from Active Events and um, uh, a sort of member of our team, uh, Jess Partridge, who set up the whole key change initiative and the um idea is that we we really want to look at how we can we can encourage people to start thinking about how to export their music and how to think beyond things like showcasing and part of that is to to work with other industries and part of it is to look at other sources of of income that they might not really know about or not know enough about to really take advantage of it so Last year we had a whole round table with music and tourism because mm -hmm. um, uh, I also found time to host the world's first music tourism conference back in 2016. And um, we also had something around a round table around music and games. And so this year we're, we're looking at various things which um, are of interest. So one is how music and government slash the public sector can collaborate more effectively and there's there's some really interesting examples of that the universal basic income that's been piloted in ireland at the moment uh, for for artists across the board and um, there's a music cities network that's been going for several years that's just about to publish a handbook on policy, music in government policy. Um, we've got an academic, Dr. Adam uh, Bear, and uh, funny saying doctor, I don't think I've said that before, his name before, but um, he's he's um, working on a map that would, of a music map, and this concept will allow governments to see where venues, for example, are, close to areas of multiple deprivation and you know where the venues can play a part in helping regenerate areas or you know could really be used as a policy to full stop um we also got a strand that's focusing on science um originally i'd hoped to do this in partnership with the Edinburgh Science Festival, but uh, alas, that didn't happen. So we just decided to go ahead with it anyway. Um, so we're actually on at the same time, our dates overlap. Um, but within that, I, you know, the, there's a lot of really interesting things. I mean, I s spoke to um, a young artist for my column in Scotland on Sunday called Cleo, and mm -hmm. she devised this this uh, 360 environment um, during the pandemic, which she then um, put live performances into. So, you know, you can watch this either on a, you know, VR headset, or you can watch it with, a, you know, through your mobile. And I thought, great, you know, this is, this is a really good example of DIY creativity and where technology can be used um, obviously, on a much bigger level, I was amazed by this concept that SWG3 have um, in Glasgow have pioneered with a company called Town Rock Energy from Edinburgh. And it, what it does is it harnesses the body heat of clubbers and um, the audiences in the in the venue, and it stores this energy in these 
these things god what I, god I, I wrote the description of this and and now i've forgotten what what it uh what the word is but anyway it stores the the energy in these things in the ground and then when they need that it converts it into electricity so when it's, it's this kind of virtuous circle i mean i know that gyms have done it for quite a long time where if you're on a treadmill they'll use that that energy to convert into electricity but the idea of a you know a clubber the power of clubbing you know um i i, I really like that so they they're part of a, a strand called 15 minutes of knowledge and we realized that very often people could sum a, a subject up in quarter of an hour give you all the stuff that you really needed and it meant that we could cover topics without having to build a whole panel around it so you know it could be a service in the past we had soundcloud or bandcamp or it could be uh uh you know a concept or a you know could be an idea so we we've, we've got a whole 15 minutes of knowledge strand within the science element there's also something that's looking at adaptive and interactive sound so it's um both in the in recorded music but also in the live um environment and that fascinates me. I mean, I first heard about this a few years ago. So the idea that, you know, if you if if you do something different while you're listening to the music, the music adapts to that as well. So there's that science strand. And then coming back to the income side of it, I think there's a real tendency to either look at music purely as a cultural thing or purely as a business thing. And and I feel both are really important. Um and one can't really exist with the, without the other. And one of the things that the pandemic really taught us was just how vulnerable artists dependent on artists dependent on purely on live income were. And I mean, not as vulnerable perhaps or as um as sound engineers or tour managers who really couldn't do anything else. Most most artists I knew no were able to record and write music and catch up on their royalties or sort out their their website or whatever but i think that it still was a a really um important lesson so there is a lot of money to be made from sync so having your music licensed for film tv trailers games uh, there's you know, even sort of small, uh, smaller blogs sometimes license music. So, um, sorry, podcasts, and and I think the the problem with that is is that people just don't really understand what the dynamics are around that. So the idea is that we ran a free event um, earlier this week, where is a four hour event with a music supervisor um, leading it with a another music supervisor and a sync agent. They're really just telling people all the stuff that needs to be in place so that they can then pitch their music. And we're, we're going to do something at Y Days that looks at, you know, is a listening session, it's a feedback session, but instead of having A&Rs or people from record labels or music journalists, what we're going to do is have music supervisors and sync agents. So the idea is that everyone who submits has to have has to have taken part in that pre-event or has to watch the the recorded version and have everything ready. So if one of those music supervisors says, I've got a film trailer that this would be great for, or I'm working with a games company that might be interested in that, the music's ready to go and they can, you know, they can basically earn money without leaving the house. And this isn't going to substitute live income, but then lots of smaller acts don't make money from live anyway, or it's really hard earned money. So I think just adding an extra string to their uh, their collective bows is a is a good move. And we we've also got one of the one of the speakers that took part in the online event giving a history of music and advertising, and another one talking about. Um, the stuff that just loses people's sinks, you know, pitching your music to the wrong person, not having your rights cleared, 
um, you know, not using someone's name in an email, which is a kind of re reoccurring theme, regardless of who you talk to. Um, you know, she's her, her name's Pam Lewis Rudden. She's uh, an American living in in England, and her um, she's very she, she's very vocal about stuff that irritates her, but she's also extremely generous with her time. So there is that element that. If you listen to her and follow her and instructions, then you're vastly going to increase your chances of getting your, your music synced. Do you get any pushback from musicians who, as you say, they maybe just see what they do as of cultural importance and it needs to be pure and, you know, business is something that almost, you know, it's a bad word if you like? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I would, wouldn't say that... I necessarily get pushback, but I think that there's a tendency in music that people think because they know a few chords on a, a guitar or they've recorded something um, or written a song that they're, they're owed a living and they should be paid. And I don't think people who have a set of watercolors and can paint a nice still life, expect that. They do it for the the joy. And one of my friends, Scott Cohen, who's spoken at a lot of uh, different Y Days events, he's the founder of the Orchard Digital Distribution Company. His take on this is that, you know, you have people that play Sunday league football or they, um, you know, they, they enjoy cycling and they spend a lot of money on cycling gear, but the people playing that um, amateur football do not expect to be playing at premiership level and earning premiership wages. Um, and it's the same with, you know, folk that spend a fortune on cycling, love going cycling, but they, they don't feel that they're entitled to a place on the Tour de France, you know? Mm -hmm. And and I think that there is um, a tendency for a lot of artists to to blame everything everything but themselves and and I, I can you know I've obviously mentored a, a lot of artists over the years and and I can see the ones that generally prevail um there is a you know there is a, an, an element of luck but I would say it's it's more an element of when an opportunity comes that you're you're ready to take it and you do take it and I'd say by and large, those artists that really have got the work ethic and me are making music that people want to hear will will ultimately have a much better chance of um of making a living out of it. Now, one of the things that I always say is that, you know, at the moment there is uh there's a lot of um there's a lot of railing against streaming services and there is a, uh, you know, there's no doubt that some elements of streaming need to be reformed, but you, you know, you could generally tell when someone's um, not well informed because they just go on about Spotify and, you know, maybe they should be looking at YouTube payments and how, um, how opaque they are. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is an element there where, Spot what well, Spotify at the moment and people's rage against Spotify and the playlists, the equivalent and you know railing against uh, big promoters and again you know the we're looking at how the live industry there's a panel on this at Y Days could be reimagined so you don't have two absolutely massive operators uh, one of which is affiliated to you know is owned by the same company that sells the tickets. Um, mm -hmm how that could be reimagined. But let's let's look at it this way. I I think that the, this in our times, let's say Spotify and Live Live Nation are the two companies that everyone rails against. And 20 years ago it was, you know, HMV and um, you know, not getting on a radio one playlist. And so you you kind of suddenly have this, you know, every generation has their um, has their thing that um, they're they're angry about, you know. And I think sometimes with you know with justification, but more often than not, when I look at someone railing against Spotify and why they haven't had their, you know, why they haven't notched up loads of streams or ended up in playlists, 
they have nothing on their uh, they have nothing in their biography. They don't use the the shop that they could use. I mean, I, I've been you know served ads um, to buy vinyl from bands that I'm listening to on Spotify, and you know they don't have their tour dates on there, and they you know so there's they don't have their social media links. And you're like, well, okay, get all that stuff done, and then if it's not working, then you know, look at uh, look at what other factors could be in there. But, you know, in saying all that, I have a huge amount of empathy and sympathy for artists that I do see really um, putting in the time, making great music and, you know, still initially not getting the, the success that other people, you know, who seemingly get plucked out of nowhere um, do and you know to be honest I think there's quite a lot of arts where it looks like they've been plucked out of nowhere but they've been drafting behind the scenes since you know they were in their teens even playing open mic nights and pubs and you know all sorts of stuff or when you you know look at the success of Dylan John Thomas or Jerry Cinnamon I mean those those guys spent years busking so you know, the fact that they've, you know, seem to have had this meteoric rise is it, it, it doesn't really tell the full story because that's when they've they've started to, you know, get noticed and it's had this mushroom effect. But you know, for years before that, they were they were playing the streets of Glasgow and, and honing their craft. Absolutely. And talking about the bands and musicians, how do you select them? Well, the Traditionally, we had um, when we only had six or seven slots. Um, the in the early days, the only criteria was one of us had to absolutely love the act, and it was it was really um, you know at that point we had no public funding. We had you know it cost us money to put on the showcase, but we really believe that it was an important thing to do. So in that regard, we are just, it was pretty self-indulgent to be honest. If one of us really loved an act, we would just be like, right, I want this one. And then there'd be a discussion and we'd we'd eventually get six or seven acts on the bill. And that could mean that one of us would utterly hate a band, but someone else really loved them. And I mean, it, led for, it still leads for some amusing conversations. In after seven years of doing it, or was it the eighth year, we finally got some support from Creative Scotland mm -hmm. and a little bit of support from PRS Foundation. So at that stage, we decided it, it had to be a more less a less self indulgent process and a you know a more um, let's say separate process from us. So what we started to do was bring in people from outside to grade the applications and each year we we would um we would add things to to the mix you know because part of it is to we feel it's important to detach our personal tastes from what we've essentially developed as a talent development program over the past few years and really be open to artists that aren't necessarily from from our particular community or you know let's say from a from a genre that we don't know uh, much about mm -hmm. so the way we've done that and this year has been a kind of record year in the sense that we had close to 20 people based in Scotland by and large listening to the um listening to all the applications and then that was um that they came up with a long list of 25 acts and um then we had an external um panel which includes the the booker for south by southwest the booker for eurosonic which is europe's biggest showcase event and a whole host of people are mainly based outside Scotland. Oh, so nice. I think quite often there's a tendency in countries for people, who, oh, yeah, we this is great, this is amazing. And then you're like, yeah, but people outside Scotland will have heard an uh, equivalent from pretty much every country in the world. So someone that seems like amazing in, to Scottish audiences isn't really that 
going to sort of compete with the equivalent of, you know, the equivalent type of act in Spain or, you know, Canada, wherever it might be. So last year, what we did was we had seven showcase, seven, seven acts on our talent development program. We also ran a, um, a sort of opening night with the Music Venue Trust. And then on the Saturday, we had our festival takeover. So the, um, this seems like I'm, I'm really going around the houses, but I'm trying, you know, I want to bring it up to date. So the way it worked this year is that the, um, we reduced the number of artists on the talent development program because it, it was just, um, it was just costing us too much time last year. And we also found the, you know, the, the majority of artists didn't, fulfill everything on their side of the agreement so that that can be quite dispiriting and you know so you're we said let's reduce it from six places or seven places to four but then let's open up the Friday to acts who don't want to commit to a 12-month mentoring program so we create more more spaces for those acts and that's a far lighter touch application you know, they we still ask at least one band member to be at the conference because there's not much point in showcasing if you're not going to connect with all the the people that we're bringing to Edinburgh. And so we whittled the um, 25 places uh, on the long list down to a short list and I think we interviewed six or seven acts. It turned out one of them wasn't able to take part in the mentoring, the first mentoring day. So we offered them a slot on the Friday showcase and we offered uh, another slot to the um, to one of the other acts on the, the Friday showcase as well. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it still allows us to give them support. And as for the rest of the, the Friday, we brought in, it's a lot less formal, we brought in, you know, some external people to advise us on genres that we perhaps weren't so familiar with. And we also looked at where artists were, you know, is there any point in showcasing someone that's just brought out their first single or where, you know, the, the feedback has been that they could wait another year. And that, that that's a that's an inexact science. You you yeah. sometimes get it badly wrong, and other times you're you're putting on acts that, you know, way way before anything starts to happen. By the time stuff starts to happen, people have forgotten that you did it in the first place. So you know, De Declan Welsh and um, you know the Dead Pony are two examples who showcased five years ago, and now Dead Pony are playing South by and, you know, doing all these great things. Um, and, you know, with Declan last year was when he, you know, he headlined the Barrowlands, but, you know, it's one of those, he does remember, which is really nice, but it is, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily associate wide days with that because it, yeah. it's so long ago. And so, I mean, the other thing is that we were, you know, we actually, as far as I know, are the first, music industry showcase that had a majority of female fronted acts that was back in 2016 the only people that actually uh referenced that in in a positive way were middle-aged blokes um you know writing for the likes of the herald and stuff and you know at the same time everyone is still sharing that that poster festival poster with you know all the male acts taken out and i was like well you know, you should be sharing that, but you should really be shouting about the fact that there's some amazing emerging acts on our bill and that we are doing the opposite. And the, the following year, we were also the first gender balanced uh, international music conference in the UK to, you know, in our in our conference program. Now, you know, fast forwarding to now, I mean, we, one of the problems we had last year with the applications, the process, the mentoring process was that um although we had a gender balanced panel uh, you know so literally the same amount of women assessing the applications the the top five acts that um 
that were all the six acts, I think even, no, top five acts were were all male or maybe, you know, mixed with one female member. And we were like, well, we don't want a lineup of 20 blokes for every bloke. So we, we also look at that where we know that there's, um, there's artists that, um, you know, on the Friday we can balance that balance that out with ours that we know are really good and that you know can use that opportunity and you know that I think is a it's a, a way where it allows us to you know refine the lineup based on our own knowledge so you know the the mentoring program is is uh, chosen by is chosen by the um panel the Friday is a bit more sort of light touch where we bring in advice from outside and the Saturday with the festival takeover is uh, done in consultation with the the festival takeover partners. So with with them for Montreal, I had already had a wish list of four acts that I really wanted. Um, only two of them were available, so they then sent us suggestions for other acts. And you know, it took us weeks of actually finding ones that were available that you know we liked and which the festival approved of and with focus wales we've again it's a discussion because focus wales take acts from scotland and mm -hmm. you know there's we'll suggest artists but they also then go well we want this one or we're really into this so um that's the way it's kind of it, it's the way it's worked out um this year unfortunately we've only got two acts from Wales where we wanted to get three, but um, we'll, because they take Scottish acts, we'll, we'll balance that out and have like a, at least one local band on as well on the Saturday night on the Focus Wales Festival Takeover. And is this international aspect of it really important? The international element's really important. And I think that it's something we've always done, even when we had no money. Uh, the The difficulty is, is that you're then really, really limited in how many international people you can get. And and I think that, you know, there is a tendency for some events with huge budgets just to fly everyone in and put them, you know, have loads and loads of international people. And I think with us, we we try and be quite strategic about it. So when it came to the festival takeover, we invite various export offices and um, showcase events to Edinburgh to take part in a mini summit. And the idea was really like to say, well, okay, how could this work for you? How could this, how could this help you promote your talent? Because we didn't want to do what everyone else does, which is basically uh an ex music export office buys a, a stage or buys a slot and puts on a bunch of uh a bunch of acts and we said well very often festivals have a stronger brand than your artists the arts from their country so the long-term aim of it was to go okay let's get a festival from somewhere that can that wants to promote or do some promotion in the uk they'll have a really good idea of which type of acts go down well with international audiences. Mm -hmm. And we can combine that with food and drink that's typical, or we can um, can even work with a tourism office to uh, promote the destination of where the festival takes place. And that's still a work in progress. I mean, I think that this year with them for Montreal is where we're really getting closest to that. Um, we've been working with the Montreal government um, representatives in uh, the UK. We've there. We're going to be serving, you know, Montreal bagels or Quebec bagels. I didn't realize this until very recently that there's there's different types of bagels, and the ones that are most common in Edinburgh are actually. Um, are actually the Montreal variety. So okay. um, they'll be served, you know, there is a, I think there's a real, a, we've got a, a whiskey tasting for the speakers and the, the conference delegates um, just beforehand, which will include a, a Montreal uh, whiskey as well. So, you know, there's all those elements where you can kind of combine that. And I think that, 
you know, on top of that, our view is, is that you're most likely to do business where you're able to hang out with folk and connect with them. So there's the conference part, which is a day and a half, and we've got these different international strands. We've got a, a Mexican delegation and a, a Canadian delegation. But apart from them doing a panel, we've got them, we've got a dedicated meeting strand where we are really encouraging Scottish professionals to use those opportunities to build a connection in, let's say, the formal conference setting, but then afterwards in the informal setting of the guided coach tour that I take um, for the for the speakers, um, or in the you know the Saturday morning where Glasgow Music City tours also do an Edinburgh Music tour, so they're gonna they're gonna do a tour for delegates in the morning. We've got a, a lunch for the delegates and then the whiskey tasting. So the these are all elements where the the delegates can connect. But what we also do is for us, it's really important that artists connect and. Quite often, the artists that I see really developing internationally are the ones that have a, a connection to musicians from elsewhere. And I think it's why you see such strong ties in things like the punk scene. So, you know, where, um, you know, Dun, uh, Dundee with Make Your Aim Fest has basically got a, an international punk festival which attracts people from all around the world. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they do that because there's, they have to really, you know, there's this, um, it's also, I guess, in the roots of the, you know, that kind of whole um, anarchist punk movement from yeah. the 80s and, um, you know, which, which I remember well, and, you know, has a, had real, had a real network around Europe. And I think in the States as well. And mm -hmm. equally, you know, the the world of a lot of traditional music is is connected in that way as it is in metal. And I think that sometimes it's that thing of explaining to ours that I, let's say working in more, you know, and I use the term loosely mainstream genres, um, be it rock or pop or, you know, mm -hmm. a, um other formats and and i think that what we try to do is say well look if you're if you're a local artist then the fact that we've got four bands from canada and we've got two acts from wales um and we've got artists from different parts of scotland that is an opportunity as well and it's a really good opportunity to create a a community um, through YD. So we actually host an artist brunch every year as well. So the idea is that all the musicians that play the event have an opportunity to meet, um, to talk to each other and, you know, hopefully to to develop, you know, something creatively. I mean, Constant Follower um, or, you know, the founder of Constant Follower, uh, McCall, he he made friends with Dana Sipos, who the Canadian artist who played last year, and they're looking to actually uh, they're looking to uh, record together. In yeah. fact, maybe are recording together already. So, you know, on the flip side, it could be someone that just is like, oh, I'm going to be playing in in Montreal. Um, is there a floor I can sleep on, yeah. or can someone yeah. lend me a guitar, or you know, or just actually having a friendly audience that you know can come and support? Yeah. I think it would be good to let people know what's on the program, where they can find it, how they can get tickets, and how they can get involved. What's the best place to go? The best place to go is the the website. So it's widedays.com. Um, there's two strands if you're an artist or you're um, a music industry professional, then you know the conference is something that is really worth attending because you can you can book meetings with the speakers, you can learn a whole load of really useful stuff you can make connections and if you're more uh just a music lover that doesn't really um isn't really involved in any mm. you know music industry career things then do uh come along to the evening showcases the the thursday is free you just need to sign up for uh a ticket and say which act you you want to see 
the Friday and Saturday is um, a, a nominal uh, fee and it's, I think it's, um, now I should really know this and it's really bad that I don't, but I think it's £10 for the Friday, £10 for the Saturday or £15 for both nights. And that gets you um, into all the three venues on the Friday, the Bongo Club, Sneaky Pete's and La Belle and Gel. So, um, all the acts playing on there and then on the Saturday it gets you into the the two festival takeover um, gigs. So that's four acts from Canada, two from Wales and um, two from Scotland. So that's in Sneaky Pete's and La Belle and Gel. And just worth mentioning as well, I mean, this is the something that a lot of showcase events tend to put artists in places that aren't really venues it's a subject that we're going to be dealing with in the conference for YD. So they'll put them in a, some really horrible bar, um, you know, which which the sort of place that has like, you know, bad shop promotions um, or just isn't a music or is a sports bar or something like that. Or they'll um, put them on in a, you know, in a sort of random restaurant. Mm. We really feel that the art, especially if they're coming from far away, but just in general, should be able to have a minimum standard, expect a minimum standard. So like a proper venue um, with, you know, professional sound engineers with a, um, with a proper sound check and with, um, you know, some food, you know, I mean, it, it seems really basic and they all get a fee as well. So, you know, there's a, if you're if you're putting if you're buying a ticket or you're like all right you know basically see it is that for the price of two pints you're a getting lots of music and b you you know that these artists are you know being treated well by you know a showcase event because lots of showcase events don't treat the artists well and I think it's even from the outset when we had like we had no money at all we would make sure that you know, there would be uh, the same fee as for a support slot and we'd feed the musicians. And from year two, we always gave them passes for the conference as well. So, you know, a lot of events, believe it or not, don't do that. Mm. So the artists travel from the other side of the world, they get one conference pass. And if they want to uh, go to the conference, then they, you know, more, more than one person, they have to, you know, shell out whatever the fee is for that. Well, I have to say, it all sounds amazing. Is there anything you're particularly looking forward to yourself? Um, I'm really excited about the showcase acts that I've not seen. I mean, I think we have a really strong and varied lineup, and my my sort of act of let's say self indulgence is something called the Bat Rave, which is you know I love kind of interesting concepts, and it ties in with science as well, and the You'll be finishing the Friday evening with um, with a duo who um, is a place called Hospital Fields near Arbroath that does a lot of arts residencies, and they they recorded the echo, the what's it what do you call it echo sound of the um, of fourteen different bat varieties, wow. and using that and recordings of uh, Hannah the vocalist, they basically made. 14 tracks which I would say just are a quality acid house there's a couple that aren't so much acid house but I love it right so I mean that's that's something that there's a Canadian act called Lauren Sam that I've been you know listening to for a couple of years and I never thought she would actually be playing our event uh, but overall I'm really looking forward to that I'm really looking forward to the um you know some of the more unusual uh conference um conference topics and last year we hosted something an event an online event a year ago to bring together 30 mexican music professionals and um 30 from scotland and wales combined and the idea that we've now got a mexican delegation coming to white days is uh Something again that you know, if you'd asked me a year ago that this would be happening, I, I would never have believed it. So, you know, the the whole thing with it is overall, it's just a really nice way to bring people together. And 
you know, hang out and, you know, have people from, connect people from Scotland with the, the rest of the world. So I hope you're going to come. I am going to try my very best. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll put you, I'll send you, a, I'll send you a guest code because uh, it'd be lovely to have you there. And, you know, also, you know, if there's anyone that you might want to speak to for a, for a future podcast, then yeah. we're happy to make introductions as well. Well, thank you very much, Ola. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Yes, Ola, it's a real pleasure. I've realised that, we, you know, before we, we started recording, we were talking about how uh, you know, we try and fit into half an hour, but I can see that was that was massively ambitious. But... Yes, it was. <laughs> we tried our best, but never mind. But all the best with this year's wide days. Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure talking to you. And we'll be back soon with someone completely different.